So to start off the Dask tutorial series, um, I'm just going to start off by showing how to set up a client and how the client works and how you can view various parts of the Dask, dash, the Dask dashboard as, as you run through things and keep an eye on your data is actually being worked on. Um, so yeah, so to start off with, so I've just got a a uh, Jupyter Lab, uh, Jupyter Notebook running on ARE. And the first thing you'd need to do is, is you'd need to first load in the Dask dis distributed module. So just like that. So if you're using the basic version, you'd want, you just want this line. And then you did load in all your other modules that you need as per your code, just for the example today, I'll have X-Array just to show you how the Dask dashboard operates. And then to start up the client, it's just this one line. And then this prints the client information. So I'll just run that now. So Dask and X-Array could be a, be a little bit slow when loaded in. Okay, cool. So when your Dask client starts up, this this information here will print out. I should ask everybody can read and see this okay? Yeah, it can be easily seen. Okay. Okay, so it, it shows out this client that you've got running and there's lots of information where you can see. So if you go into the cluster info, you can see various things. So here, the standard amount of workers it sets up is seven, 14 threads. So this is where all your processes or all your data stuff is going to be split up into all of this to get working on. And then the total memory you asked for in this session. And then you can see all your your workers and things here. Not so, but the more impo most important part about this is this little URL, URL here, this dashboard. And if you copy that, go over to this Dask I, um, symbol on the left, you can enter this in here and it'll load up all of these things um, and there's a lot of a lot of a lot of options here and there's a lot of information um, i've just got a i've got a couple of loaded on the side here that i would use most often and to show how they show what they look like it's easier to just start running things so this is just very basic era five data and I'm just loaded it in with X-ray just to show how this runs and why certain things take so long when you don't think they're going to take long. So to load it in here, so this tab I have open is called the progress and this is probably the one I use the most often. And this will show you all the things that need to happen for your task to, to be done. So as you can see, that goes along and this is basically just opening the data sets. It's not not really that difficult. So as you work through your notebook, the important thing when using Dask and XRA is whenever you run a thing like this, so here I'm just resampling my data to mean over time for daily. This should happen pretty quickly. And as you can see, nothing is actually happening on the right-hand side because Dask is is our lazy, lazy operations. And That'll be spoken more about next week, I think, on compute and all of those and, and what's actually happening. But for our dashboard here, I'm just going to compute. I'm just going to load now load all our data. And as you can see, that resample and the select and the open the data sets were really, really quickly because nothing actually has happened yet. It's not until I run this compute where the data is loaded and the mathematical operations happen. So when I run this, on the right here, um, yeah, it'll show you all the things that need to happen for this task to, to 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 be finished. So we need to concatenate all the data, get the data, use the array, and do our actual mean. So as you look through all these things, this shows all our workers and the amount of memory that it's taking up, and also the memory is shown down at the bottom here. And these are really important because you don't want all your workers to use more memory than you've actually assigned. So if these start getting close to your assigned RAM, that means you need to set up a new ARE session with more RAM. 
And you have the other ones that shows all more information about it. So <clears throat> how much CPU, sorry. And this one shows all the workers in the CPU usage to show how much they're getting filled up. And if these start to get filled up too much, then maybe you need a session with more CPUs. So we'll see. And yeah, so that'll be finished and I'll pretty much be done there and then that disappears. So as you can see, then it loads and the data is actually there now. So there's a couple of more options you can mess around with when starting up your Dask client. And it's this local cluster option. So I won't go into huge amounts of details. Uh, you can look up Dask local cluster because there's several options that you can mess around with. But two of the options I use most will be actually specifying how many workers you want running. So here's the seven workers are is sort of the default, I think, in Dask. Now I've started this session with 14 CPUs. And maybe I want one worker per CPU. In this case, I can specify I want 14 CPUs, so one per CPU. Then another option that sometimes when I'm trying to do really heavy task intensive tasks, there's an option where you can tell so this this is if you definitely have more RAM than your workers are using. You can tell that your worker is not to be limited by a number. So maybe when you set up your clients, each worker could be told it can't use more than two gigabytes of RAM out of the hole. If you select zero here, it can just be infinite. But the risk you run there is if your tasks, your task can start to fail once you run out of RAM. So you just have to be careful that you, you do have enough RAM for that. And there's a lot of other options. And if you go to like the Dask. the Dask website is a great site for knowing about all this information and looking up settings. They're actually documented things really well. So this is the local cluster. And as you can see, there's, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can set, which are quite important. But day-to-day -day stuff, you probably only, you only want this. Excuse me, Sam, can I jump yep. in with a question? Sure. What's the difference between a worker and a CPU? That's a good question. So the CPU is the is the physical entity. It's how many CPUs you've asked for on a supercomputer. Uh, it's a physical thing. The workers are how DAS. Okay, keep. Let's put Basically into, uh, something abstract set up by Dask. Yeah, let's think of like a physical job. And let's say you're trying to build a building. Yep. The building is the job, is the physical yep. entity. Then you, to get that job done faster or more efficiently, you might, you might set seven workers to build it. Yep. And the jobs are split between those seven. They talk to each other to progress at the same time. That's pretty much the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And so can multiple workers operate within a, one CPU? Yeah, you can split the CPU. In, you could say seven workers on the one CPU. So if okay. your CPU, if you're running a job that's not using up the whole CPU, or yeah, it's not using up the whole CPU, you could run seven and that splits it up into the seven and that will make things run faster. Yeah. Uh, a CPU in this case is the way that um, PBS uses the NCPUs resource so it's at the core right that is a thing yep. that does maths yeah and a worker is a program that sits on top of that and it's just waiting for instructions it's just waiting for some jobs to do as sam okay. said with the building and yep. so you can have you can run eight workers on a single physical core they'll all just get in each other's way uh the way um sam the way this job splits it up is it's got half as many workers as cores, but each one of those workers is multi-threaded. So it can, in principle, utilize two um, CPU cores at once. And so there's yeah. different ways okay. you can split that up, yeah. but you don't really have to worry, like Sam said, you don't really have to worry about that. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, that does help me differentiate between the two. Thanks. 
Um, I'm just looking at the chat too. There were one or two questions in the chat. Uh, Richard, oh, so, okay. So yeah, to get the, the dashboard on the side here, I'll, I'll just exit out of all of them. So if you, when you open up Dask here and you select, let's say on the, it's got some, yeah, let's just say the progress. Yeah, it naturally goes up to the top there. You're able, you're able to just, sorry, all this zoom is getting in my way. Okay, you're able to just click and hold on it and drag it, and you can put it into all these positions, whichever one. Can you see the blue sort of area? Yeah, so you can just drag and drop. And I can move that if I want, I could, yeah, I can do another one. And then if I set start another one, there's my CPUs, they'll go over there. Maybe I want them both at the same time, look at the same time. It's just the same way you drag and drop windows on your own machine. It's quite I handy. Also, I find that clicking on launch dashboard in JupyterLab gives you a nice layout as well. How oh, does it? Yeah, that seems to work in 2304. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. Or it doesn't. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, be is, right. that a new, is that a new setting? Because I don't even know yeah. earlier. Oh, it works for me now, maybe. Okay, that could just be me. That could just be my browser. Yeah, actually, it works also on my PC, so I'm not sure. Okay. Where 